I hope that uh, you can hear me well. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on the blind evaluation pilot uh, that has been used uh, from this year in uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, my name is Stefano Potemicelli. I'm the head of uh, the uh, European RDI support team here in Innovation. We are the national contact point for Luxembourg uh, for Horizon Europe. We are also national delegate. We will go shortly into this um into the also the difference between uh, these two roles that we have um since uh, this is the first time also for me that i'm running this webinar on our new platform for that uh, just uh, some uh, housekeeping messages for you feel free to uh, text uh, introduce yourself uh, in the discussion tab where Nat uh, natalie is uh, already typing in some information and where Patricia has already responded. Hi, Patricia. Uh, please also uh, uh, use the question uh, tab for your questions. I hope we will have uh, a lot of questions at, uh, at the end of the presentation. For uh, practicality, I will tackle all of them at the end. I will not, um, I will not respond to questions unless there's something really, really urgent uh, that has, is not clear in the slides. During, during, during the presentation. So, uh, yes, please feel free to use the question tab. Uh, I hope that there will be a lot of questions. Uh, we had a very similar event with the Commission two days ago, and uh, indeed, uh, we bombarded the Commission with questions for more than one hour. So, uh, I hope it will be still the case for, to, for us today. And uh, I have tried to keep the presentation short and, uh, and light in order to make, uh, to keep a lot of time for, for, for your doubts. And uh, yes, I think we are ready to go with the, with, with the presentation. So, Horizon Europe and Blind Evaluation Pilots. We are, uh, the, our team is the National Contact Point and National Delegate for Horizon Europe in Luxembourg. What does it mean? What does it mean in practice, uh, this double role that we have? We are national contact points, so we support all the applicants from the country in their entire application journey. Uh, we find the right calls and partners for your innovation journey. We respond to legal and financial questions. We help with administrative matters and project management. We also are, uh, we also participate in a number of uh, European projects ourselves, and these projects are dedicated to the uh, scope of exchanging best practices with other NCP networks in the other countries. You have, for instance, seen, uh, many of you were probably present already at the Horizon Europe Day, where we present last, uh, in, uh, before before Christmas last year, where I presented some of the outcomes of such projects, where we work, for instance, on the annotated proposal template, on the technology readiness level guide, and a number of other tools. And yes, the board game, the famous board game. We are also national delegates to the program committees of Horizon Europe, so our scope there is to represent the country's interest in the preparation of the work programs for research and innovation. Uh, so we are there to, uh, well, we are there sitting in these committees, bringing the country's interest. We are there to bring in, to convey to the Commission your message in the formulation of the work program. So to make sure that your keywords are well represented in the, uh, in the, new, in the newly established calls. We also participate to the state representative groups of a number of public-private partnerships. So again, uh, this is our role to make sure that our interests are well represented in these uh, PPPs that are behind, a little behind in the uh, pathway towards the codes, so that we are sure that our priorities are uh, in incorporated in the strategic research innovation agenda of this pathway. So we are there to listen to you also. We are here to listen to you to make sure that you can find your place in Horizon. What's our approach? We have, uh, we support you, as I told you already, in the entire uh, 
application journey. So we start from meeting with you, understanding what's your RDI strategy, what are your research priorities. And in parallel, we monitor the European RDI policies and agendas, and we identify and suggest the most relevant funding opportunities for you. We then help you structure your uh, research innovation projects so that they are well responding to the calls. And in this, we also search for partners and consortia that can, uh, where you can uh, fit your project idea. Or if you are looking for partners, we can look into the extensive databases that we have for who are the right partners for your innovation in case you need some. We support and monitor the, the entire grant application. And this webinar uh, will explain to you, for instance, how we can support and monitor, and we can support you in the, uh, the grant application for proposals that are using a blind evaluation uh, approach. And uh, we respond to your legal and financial uh, doubts. We are doing this by trainings, by workshops, uh, public or tailor-made. So we are, uh, we are giving you this webinar, other trainings such as proposal writing. We are uh, meeting you individually on a case-by-case -case basis, but we also organize events, uh, more events like this one. Horizon Europe, now you probably already know pretty well uh, Horizon Europe. We have uh, already uh, we have already had two years of this uh, uh, research innovation funding program from the European Commission. It's the largest so far. It's running from 2021 and will last until 2027. It's 95.5 billion euros for seven years. And 35% uh, are dedicated to climate change related projects. Uh, just to give you uh, a hint of how many projects we have attracted so far in Luxembourg, we have more than 150 projects already, already funded. And uh, if we take a cut of the age of the end of uh, 2022, we already attracted 70, 75 million euros in total. Just uh, to give you a reference, uh, the entire uh, financial return for Horizon 2020 was 200 million euros. So we are uh, increasing our performances and it's thanks to your uh, brilliant innovation project. Um, Horizon Europe is very strongly linked to a number of policies. Uh, the international impact is represented by the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, which are very well connected also to the concept of green transition in Europe. Um, the Green Deal, so how we can transform our uh, continent into a climate neutral economy by 2050, and uh, the digitalization strategy of the European Commission, the Shaping Europe Digital Future, and how also how these two policies work together. So how the digital technologies can be uh, instrumental for the climate neutrality. You know it already, uh, so projects can be of different nature and approach. And approaches, most of the, pro most of the calls are calling for collaborative projects where consortia composed of at least three legal entities from three member states or associated countries uh, have to submit their joint research initiatives. Uh, free is the minimum requirement, but it's not the target. You should normally aim for larger application, larger consortium, but you can also have individual projects. You can have bottom-up, free subject calls where you can, where the Commission accepts projects from all the technological fields or sector of activity, but you also have, an, well, and that's uh, the biggest share of the program, top-down calls with a compulsory subject defined by the Commission together with the member states and a number of interest groups that are proposing their research priorities. And this is where we do our role of protocol. To, to, to give you a bit of more context for this webinar, we are today talking more about collaborative calls with compulsory subjects. So the uh, blind evaluation applies to collaborative calls that are mostly targeting pillar two of Horizon Europe, the global challenges pillar. 
So uh, everyone can play a role in a Horizon Euro project. Uh, you have this nice summary on the slide. I will not go into very much details uh, on this, uh, but it's important for you to know that the program is really open to everyone. Everyone can play a role, everyone can participate, everyone can bring something, but everyone will get something. I will make it, uh, the example of a researcher who can get valorized for their uh, for their excellence capacity of performing research, and they will have to bring their cutting edge funding. A city can become a test bed. Uh, we have the, the example, for instance, of the Fedange, which has been very active so far in Horizon Europe. They can be test bed for new solutions and for co-designing uh, the uh, the how a city can respond better to the needs of their citizens. So let's go into the topic of today after this short introduction, the blind evaluation pilot. Blind evaluation pilot is introduced in the work programs 2023-2024, where all the two-stage calls will be evaluated blindly. Uh, except there's one exception. Of course, you always have a rule and you have an exception, but all the calls except this one in widening, will have this blind evaluation. The aim, the reason for piloting and testing this blind evaluation is a concern that came from uh, a number of uh, countries uh, about the potential bias that some uh, evaluators may have when reading a proposal coming from uh, top innovators, from uh, very expert uh, players uh, and uh, to address the fact that, for instance, there is still um, a different rate of participation from uh, EU 14 now and EU 13 countries. This is uh, uh, the, the reason of piloting, the, 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 the potential bias of evaluators when seeing proposals coming from the uh, known suspects, let's call it this way. There are independent studies that have not revealed this bias, but Still, it was the uh, Commission decided on the, on the request from the Parliament also to uh, have this test. The aim is to see whether this blind evaluation can have an impact on such bias, on such potential bias, and uh, how, if, if it's possible to have a blind evaluation in the uh, framework of uh, the Horizon Europe course. So, uh, if uh, we will see if the Commission will see many issues in applying this blind evaluation, they will um, they will evaluate what to do, whether to extend it, whether to reduce it, whether to use it in some very specific cases, or to amend it entirely. So, we will see at the end of this first year how things are going. I will uh, I will be. Honest with you, uh, it's a challenging uh, exercise from the Commission side, from our national contact point side, but it's also very challenging from an application perspective. For from your side, uh, there are uh, there's a number of issues in particular, and we will see it more in details in a in a short while. The uh, it's not about the um, intended disclosure of identity that's very simple to manage if you're saying that uh, i give an example the university of luxembourg will be responsible for this task in, in the proposal of course this is a intended disclosure of identity and that's clearly uh, an issue it's the the, the the problem starts when you have uh, indirect disclosures of identity i will give you some examples and i'm happy to um, uh, to take questions on indeed on uh, what you think can be or cannot be an indirect disclosure of identity. So, key fact it's launched in the uh, work programs 2023 2024. It's applied to all the two stages calls uh, that, uh, uh, that are going to run. And uh, two stages calls, uh, if you uh, if you already experienced them, but also for people who, are, who haven't. Was not experienced of them are those calls when you have normally a short proposal being submitted in uh, the first stage with uh, normally a 10-pager, a short proposal which is 
just be evaluated on excellence and impact. And then if you are selected in the first stage, you, can, you are invited to submit the full proposal, which is uh, the usual 45 pages um, uh, code, with the usual 45 pages document. So uh, the, there's this new admissibility criteria. Applicants submitting under a proposal under this blind evaluation pilot might not, may, might, must not disclose the organization names, acronyms, logos, or names of personnel in the Part B of the first stage application. If, if this is not the case, the uh, project is inadmissible. So you are kicked out of the game uh, before, uh, yeah, you're, you're kicked out of the game. You cannot uh, go ahead. How does it work in practice? Uh, you prepare, as before, the part A of the proposal. So the, uh, you put your partners in, uh, uh, in, in the part A, in the administrative document, but this is hidden from the experts in uh, evaluating the proposal. So they will never see the list of partners the, before reading the proposal. So um, this is not transmitted to the evaluators. And, um, and if you remember, Commission wanted to uh, actually have the Part A being included also in the first stage some, some years ago. So it's really a U-turn that they are doing. For the Part B, uh, of course, uh, uh, Part B is the narrative part of the proposal. So it's not possible for that the IT system behind the funding and tenders portal is hiding this information inside the narrative, inside the PDF file that you upload. So it's up to the applicant to omit uh, from there any identification data of their institutions. The uh, officer checks manually whether the applicant included an identification in the part B of the proposal. And if it's if you haven't been, if you haven't done it correctly, you are inadmissible. So this is from a process perspective. It's important, things that are important to know. There's the difference between a clearly inadmissible proposal, the example that I made before, University of Luxembourg, uh, Intrasoft, uh, whoever is responsible for a task, and gray zone cases. Where, and these gray zone cases where it's possible to in, uh, to uh, imagine what uh, what institution is doing some task, uh, this grades on cases will be evaluated on a case by case basis by the with the help of a legal team. Um, the commission expects that there will be admissible proposal where evaluators could guess the identity of the of the of the applicants, in particular when you have small research communities or very specific infrastructures. Um, if you mention the country of the applicant, that is, that's not necessarily means that you uh, that the proposal will be uh, inadmissible. Uh, this will happen where the applicant is clearly identified. For Luxembourg. I have to say, it, this is uh, um, this is kind of easy to understand what uh, part in some cases what partners are uh, coming from Luxembourg. Uh, we have one single university. We have three research centers with three different, very different uh, focus areas. So please pay a lot of attention. Um, You can black out names and information. This is not the preferred option, but it's accepted. Uh, I would try not to go through this route still. It's uh, kind of a risk because you can black out things and then you forget to black out something else. So I would really go for uh, a narrative of anonymization. Uh, commission will consider the intentionality the, the, the people within the legal team will work on the intentionality of uh, if disclosures, exposure of identities done by a uh, possible mistake. Uh, they, if you have experienced this already, 
you will know that uh, if you have been working already on a proposal, for instance, cluster for the first deadline is in five days, uh, you have probably seen that the annotated template has more guidance for the applicants regarding the blind evaluation process. So, Commission has run already some information events, and of course, during these information events, people came with questions about uh, this, this pilot. So, uh, I have uh, taken these questions from slides that the Commission has presented to us. Uh, first question, and it's something that is very relevant to me, is that how can the expert assess the capacity of the partners to perform the work proposal? how the consortium is, like, is in a position to implement the project. The response to this question is that in a first stage proposal, you don't, you don't speak about implementation. So the first stage evaluation is only assessing the excellence and the impact. And the impact is even a light form of the impact. Second question, how can applicants support the state of the art of the TRL of a proposal without citing their own publications or past projects? Uh, the response is that you cannot mention these publications as yours. And uh, you will have later an example of how you can put it in the text, but you can mention this uh, these publications, these patents, uh, from a neutral point of view. I can imagine a question, a patent is normally well known to the owners of the patent, so indeed it's, uh, uh, you have to be very careful about the neutrality of your statements when it comes to justify the TRL, the state of the art, the how we are going beyond the state of the art with the activities that you are proposing. And uh, can we mention government bodies by name in a blind evaluation proposal? If they are beneficiaries, then not. Uh, you uh, cannot mention the consortium structure. Uh, this will be revealed in the second stage, uh, which is not evaluate. This is important to remember. The blind evaluation only applies to the first stage. It's not applied on the second stage. There has been questions about, uh, for instance, whether you are involving a city, in uh, a municipality in, um, in a project, because some calls are specifically calling for implementation into cities. And uh, Commission is working on a uh, response to uh, to this question, and they will come to uh, they will come to that in writing. But by default, you cannot mention government bodies if they are members of consortium. Um, indeed, this is what I already said. How to manage if you have to mention the location of a pilot, a pilot plant, a type of farm, or a climatic area. Uh, of course, you cannot mention them uh, explicitly if they are uh, except. Uh, well, they can be mentioned only in the case. Uh, well, it's it's a bit tricky. It, I, I told you it's really tricky. You cannot mention if um, if they are members of the consortium. If you are working in a specific area in a specific city or. It's probably not always necess uh, necessary that the partner is uh, that that they are a partner in uh, uh, authorities from that area are a partners in the proposal. So it's a bit tricky, but Commission is working on the specific cases that are indeed requiring to demonstrate where to, to um, send in advance where this uh, activities have to be performed. So, publications. This is a clear issue, and uh, we have reviewed already a proposal where there were a lot of publications referenced. Uh, you can, of course, and you have to uh, reference um, the state of the art, you have to reference the methods that you're going to use. Uh, 
uh, you can mention your own publication, but you cannot emphasize that you are the authors of the papers. So the first example is a, a, a reference of a paper which is leading to an inadmissible proposal. So I read it for climate impact. We will use greenhouse gas emission intensities following um, a methodology developed previously by the project partner, Dalin et al. So this is leading to an inadmissible proposal. How you can make it acceptable for the system for climate impact? We will use greenhouse gas emission intensities following the, the methodology described by uh, the paper, in, the paper also by Dalin et al. So you cannot say that this guy is a project partner. Other examples of statements that can result in inadmissible proposals. So, most of the project participants have been involved in the previous NH2020 project, Nanocom. I remember even that project, and uh, this is also the case of a very small community. So, uh, this is clearly identifying who the partners are, uh, and this is not acceptable for this for the system. Uh, how can you turn it in an acceptable way? Project participants, no, not project participants. The the this project uh, will make use uh, of uh, um, the experience developed in the Nanocom project in a Nanocom H2020 project. The example that I already made of the publication. Uh, the another example tasking with in more package three will be based on output but generated by some participants in the consortium and then we put a, a, a footnote uh, where you can uh, click and see on a youtube video on a deliverable from a project uh, or papers or a website where you can identify the project participants so it's even on cross references um, the consortium includes the largest research institute in France. This is clearly uh, identifiable. Partner Free is the leading company in space in wind turbine, for wind turbine installation. Uh, I specifically asked the Commission about the, how can they make this uh, sentence acceptable, and I asked Partner Free is a leading company in space for wind turbine installation. They said it depends. Uh, how many companies you have in Spain uh, installing wind turbines? Uh, are they two or three, or are there 20? Uh, again, for Luxembourg, this can be uh, a, tricky, uh, a tricky issue. Other examples. Uh, our current research expands our previous finding that, that described in a recently published article by William in 2022. Um, the consortium consists of leaders in the high-tech industry, including the, big, the biggest in terms of capital constructor of microchips. Uh, it's uh, easy to Google uh, who's the leading uh, the leading firm, the biggest firm in capital uh, for uh, of capital constructor of microchips. You can Google that, and it's clearly leading to an amplification. Uh, the coordinator organization was one of the first, uh, was the one who first introduced uh, the concept of mRNA in vaccines. Uh, we all remember from the COVID time who was this company in Europe. The, um, there are two research centers in this consortium, and one is based in Geneva, and also the oldest university in Belgium. Uh, again, very easy to Google who's the old, uh, which is the oldest university in Belgium. It's uh, Leuven, if I remember correctly. So these all these sentences are um, uh, all these sentences are going to lead to inadmissible proposals. So, uh, yes, how to deal with this pilot? Uh, my first recommendation is when you are in doubt, ask 
ask, ask your NCP. Uh, make sure to check if the pilot applies to your proposal. If you are applying to cluster one, health, cluster four, digital industry and space, and cluster six, food by economy, circular economy, etc., and two stages close. Check very well the proposal template so that you can see they are clearly stated this proposal will be blindly evaluated. Follow the guidance. Please do not try to play with the system. Please do not try to, to try to put this hidden reference so that the evaluators may understand it because it's also the responsibility of the evaluators to flag to the commission if it's clearly identifiable who the partners are. You risk that your proposal is going to be declared inadmissible. So uh, don't risk play with the play with this rule. Come to us if you want a second opinion on what can be an indirect disclosure of identity. As I told you, uh, they, it's, you have cases where it's easy to understand, but it's also um, it's also uh, you have the gray zone cases. There's a lot of gray zone cases, so it's uh, um, we can discuss with you if we think that this is an indirect disclosure. We can also check with the commission if a possible if a statement is in line with uh, with their requirement. Redresses will be possible. Um, redresses will be possible, but this is a very tricky option. Uh, I don't know how experienced you are in Horizon in Horizon programs, but for those of you who has a long experience, you always know that redresses are uh, taken positively in a very limited number of cases. So it's very tricky. Um, it's very very tricky. So I told you I was trying to give. Um, this slides uh, in a pretty short way to take more time to take quite some time for questions. Uh, I've seen that there are questions uh, uh, in uh, the um, in this chat in this chat, uh, but I move to the questions tab um, and let's start from here. So Sabine. Sabine is asking, can we mention that we are a university or avoid even to mention the status of the institution? Uh, it's how you write it. Uh, I can give you an example. In the proposal that I saw, uh, uh, that we reviewed recently for the next cluster four deadline is uh, um, what, their, what was their approach? And I really liked it. They said the consortium is composed by three universities, two research centers, uh, four large industries, an SME, a consulting firm, and uh, a government body. They are coming from Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Sweden. In this way, you are explaining the composition of the consortium. So we are explaining that the consortium is covering uh, correctly the uh, value chain that is necessary for, uh, for the project. And you are also giving information about the, uh, the country coverage the, uh, so that you are working in a European dimension. But if uh, uh, you reshuffle that information in a way that three universities, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Sweden, that's inadmissible. Uh, I hope it's uh, uh, I hope it's clear. Uh, please uh, write again um, if you, if you have a follow up question. And again, Sabine, do, does it mean that we have to propose two Part Bs, one neutral and one with the names of the institution's PI researchers? No, you have to prepare the Part B for the first stage in a neutral way. 
So as I told you, as I told you now, uh, consortium is blah, blah, blah. They are coming from blah, blah. papers should not be referenced uh, by as by, by, should not be referenced as uh, authored by the applicants. Uh, um, uh, by the applicants, but they have to be neutral. You cannot say the largest uh, uh, company, but a large company. Uh, very active in this field, so you have to be very neutral. If you are successful at stage at stage one, then you go to step to stage two. In stage two, you are um, you can write the proposal as you were writing it in the past. Um, so, if they are in the visible, we see contact the applicants and give them the chance to resubmit. Uh, it's tricky because, of course, you uh, this is evaluated after the uh, after the deadline. So uh, after no, because normally you you submit the project after the deadline, then the then the, the project is evaluated. So uh, I I need to check. I need to check, Judith. Uh, thanks for raising the point. It's a very smart question. I take note of that, and I will see uh, how the uh, commission will deal in terms of possible resubmissions. Uh, uh, Julio, uh, 1.2 methodology section. Uh, is it required to describe uh, any national, international research and innovation activities whose results will feed into the project and how that will link that link will be established? How to do this without giving too much information on the identity of the applicant? That's really tricky. Uh, you, when uh, you uh, are addressing the session, uh, the section, uh, you are listing uh, past research projects. Uh, first, go and double check in details uh, how this is now stated in the template. Uh, I haven't read it in detail yesterday when I was preparing the, the, the webinar, but you can uh, you can do it in a neutral way. Uh, let 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 me give you uh, an example, but of course we are happy to discuss it on an individual basis. Imagine that uh, you are um, uh, citing again this Nanocom project. Nanocom project is where you were. Um, uh, you have partners coming from Nanocom. Nanocom has delivered a number of things. Uh, you can uh, you can say, for instance, that you are going to work uh, uh, in the framework of the Nano Safety Cluster. You can say that uh, you are going to establish the direct communication with people who were involved in uh, in, um, in this project. Uh, uh, you can. Uh, I would. Yeah, I would use the uh, direct communication with the um, with past partners, or uh, if you have research communities that have networking tools, this can be discussed in the framework of uh, um, such networking tools that the Commission is putting available. Um, I hope it's clear, but of course uh, we can discuss it on an individual basis. It's, I know that's probably the most tricky, the, the, the most tricky part, and I, I would really like to see how this is uh, explicitly stated in the um, in the template to see if they are allowing a bit more flexibility in, into the session. The Serena uh, Serena is asking: Is this pilot expected to give more opportunity to ranks, young researchers with less or no experience in funded projects? I would say so. Uh, the original scope is uh, is on to, well. The scope of this pilot is indeed uh, to improve uh, the access to newcomers to fund the programs. It's to avoid that the also the perception that I sometimes feel. I sometimes feel when I meet with uh, newcomers that, 
ah, this is uh, going to uh, the uh, this is going to the non sus to the usual suspect. This is going to the people that who have been uh, working with the commission in writing the calls. So indeed, there's uh, the the aim is to uh, reduce the, the reputational bias. Reputational bias indeed may come from uh, some countries, specific countries, but also may come from the fact that you um, people have uh, a strong track record in the field. And a young researcher may come with very innovative solutions, very innovative ideas, and with uh, very new approaches. So I think that it's um, that's the uh, very positive outcome that uh, we can have thanks to this, thanks to this pilot. And uh, also, I can tell you, um, uh, it's happened to me in the past that uh, I was uh, involved, uh, uh, it was in one of my previous, uh, previous jobs, and um, I was involved in a two stages application, and uh, the guy who was writing this uh, two stages application said, you know, we, we don't need to put some effort, a lot of effort because we are, uh, we are known, we are all uh, strong, uh, players in this field, people will know that even if we don't write it perfectly in the first stage, we are going to write uh, a good uh, second stage proposal. The effort was that we were not selected at the first stage and we were um, left there with no um, uh, with no possibility to write the second stage. So, you know, it's also put, it also puts some pressure on the known uh, and experienced players. So uh, it can probably also lead to better first stage proposals. Um, I think that I, I have some skepticism on the, uh, how it's easy to implement this in uh, the, how, well, the work that is putting uh, on the commission or the commission services to, to, to evaluate uh, all these gray zone cases. I am, I'm really worried that uh, this is going to be impossible to handle. And uh, also, when you have case by case evaluation, you always risk to have uh, two different ways of approaching the, the issue. So again, you have uh, you don't have an objective uh, element. You start introducing subjective element. So I think that it's a bit it's it's really tricky. Uh, let me very let me be very honest with you. Um, so it's. I see the positive, I also see the, 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 the very big challenges. Um, Shivan is asking me, uh, are the applications still open? Is there a last date? Uh, the co this applies to 2020, to, to the cluster one, cluster four, cluster, and cluster six. Cluster four, in particular, the industry part where this is apl applied, has the first deadline in, uh, on the 7th of March. So there, you still have time to rework uh, your proposal if you're not uh, confident that you are complying with this requirement. Cluster 1 will be later in the year, Cluster 6, to be honest, I don't remember the date by heart at the moment, but uh, there's a bit more time there still. Uh, so uh, again, a message for Cluster 4 applicants, if you have any doubts, come to us. And uh, there's... Uh, um, another question from Sabine. Can we mention in the part B that the PI already got one project or was already involved in several EU projects? Uh, um, yes, if you can do it neutrally. Uh, uh, how can you put it neutrally? Uh, the applicants, the consortia has already experienced uh, in uh, obtaining Horizon 2020 grants uh, in uh, this domain. Is it a? Uh, it's a bit challenging, depending on it's. Uh, it's not very neutral. I, I tell you why. It's uh, my feeling is that normally, uh, you, well, you have. It can be neutral if you are ap applying to some uh, research areas where you have many projects funded 
to the uh, many projects funded for a given call. Uh, normally, still, you have um, uh, you don't have that option. Normally, uh, if you have uh, two projects, uh, you are for for a call. You are two projects funded for a call. You are really lucky. So um, I think that is one of these uh, uh, trying to one of these solutions trying to outsmart a bit the system, right? Um, you are somehow trying to say, you know. Uh, you know that we are good because we already did it. I would avoid it because it's a um, it's a bit of it's a bit of a risk. I would rather use instead the uh, and I link to Julia's question before um, the fact that uh, I would rather use the, the uh, I would put a very extensive list of past projects that are useful for your project. In this way, you are not telling the evaluators, you know, I'm one of the good guys. You are telling the evaluators, you know, guys, I really know how to, uh, I really know the background for the, um, for this research domain. I really know uh, who to contact. I really know, uh, where to start from with my result. I really know that I'm, uh, the data that has been produced and I'm then I'm not going to uh, do unnecessary work in creating new, generating new data for, for this domain. So I think it's a safer option uh, because, uh, again, I told you, it's subjective. And uh, imagine that you combine this with the fact that you are saying uh, that you have uh, universities, uh, research centers, uh, companies, blah, blah, and then you have uh, all small countries. Imagine that you have a consortium made of uh, like Luxembourg, Cyprus, uh, Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, the, uh, the Netherlands, rather bigger. But imagine that you have a consortium made of small countries. You are already saying that you have universities, research centers, eh? and then you say we know we have been working on horizon projects on horizon projects in the past. I think that is somehow um, it's uh, somehow risky because you are at a certain point telling to the commission, you know, go look into this. This is a gray zone case. So, and when you have people start looking into it. You get in this subject subjectivity of this norm, and then you risk. I hope I've been clear with, uh, and I'm uh, happy to discuss more if you have a follow-up question on this. So um, yes, no. I thought that it would have been quicker, to be honest, and it's already 48 minutes that we're here. I'm really happy that there were so many questions, uh, and uh, I really hope that I've been able to reply in some, uh, at least, well, not 100% conclusive manner, but uh, giving you some more um, some more insights about this, uh, this pilot. Um, as I told you, it's really, it's tricky. It's, uh, the gray zone is vast. So we we know that we can get a lot of questions for, from applicants about this. We are ready to, uh, we are ready to answer to these questions. Um, here you have uh, my contact details. So please don't hesitate to contact me uh, should you want to uh, follow up on this. Uh, if you have proposals uh, uh, that you are submitting and that you want a second opinion, second opinion. Uh, if you want us also to check with the commission, is this acceptable or not? Uh, Judith, I take good note of your question. Uh, we will, I will follow up. Uh, 
either follow up in uh, writing, as the commission likes to say, when they don't have the answer immediately in the in uh, when we ask them questions. Um, we are in the process of uh, updating our uh, website, uh, Horizon, uh, Horizon Europe.edu. So please go and visit the website. Uh, we have an updated section on legal and financial, uh, legal and financial issues. Uh, we will create uh, very, very quickly a section dedicated to blind evaluation in this uh, legal and financial section. So, uh, I can I will uh, respond to Judith uh, by email. Uh, you know what? I think that we can also, if uh, um, you allow us to use your email addresses from the from the registration, uh, we um, we can. I can also send this reply to everyone, so every one of you has the same level of information. But it will also be on our website, so that uh, with all the other information that I share with you today. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be uh, on uh, YouTube channel, uh, on our YouTube channel. So if, if uh, you have colleagues uh, who are interested and want to have a further look and couldn't be here today because of the short notice uh, of this webinar, uh, please f um, forward then the link to the, our YouTube channel. Uh, if uh, there are no further questions, uh, no further points, uh, I give you some more, uh, just uh, one minute more for, uh, for questions. Uh, I thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, and yes, remember that we are always there to help you with this evaluation pilot, land evaluation pilot, with, but also with all the other questions you may have on Horizon Europe. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, I will be. I will remain online for um, for a few seconds more in case there are more questions. Thank you very much.